Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our first virtual exhibition opening and artist talk. And thank you, Libby Berlin, our ASL interpreter, for being here this evening. I'm Janie Krinas, Curator of Academic Affairs and Community Engagement here at the Phillips Museum of Art at Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We gather today on the homeland of Native peoples whose history is integral to our past and present, but long denied. In addition to the Susquehannock who lived here in the 17th century, this land was home to the Lenape, Nanakoke, Piscataway, Seneca, and Haudenosaunee Confederacy, Shawnee, and others throughout the millennia. We acknowledge that Franklin and Marshall College's presence here is a direct legacy of settler colonialism. As a college community, we commit ourselves to the ongoing work of acknowledging and respecting those who came before us on these lands and to act collectively in support of Native communities. We're so pleased to be able to host this amazing exhibition organized through Catherine T. Carter and Associates. While the physical space is currently closed, we are excited to connect with everyone this evening and look forward to welcoming everyone to the gallery on February 1st. Attendees will be able to post questions to the Q&A box throughout the presentation. Our director and collections manager, Lindsay Marino, and preparator and exhibition specialist, Chad Cheney, will present the questions to Nancy to conclude our program. Let's get started. For over 10 years, Nancy Mako documented the life cycle of the vegetables she raised in her garden, the honeybees that pollinated them and bee attracting flora using a macro lens in order to reveal the less apparent, less obvious features concealed within these beautiful specimens. She captured them from bud to bloom to seed, all manifestations of the life cycle. This work resulted in the fragile bee, first exhibited at the Museum of Art and History in Southern California in 2015, and which has been traveling since 2018 through 2023 to over 15 venues nationally. A full color catalog accompanies the exhibition. Originally from New York, Mako received her undergraduate degree from the University of Wisconsin and her graduate degrees from the University of California, Berkeley, with a concentration in painting and printmaking. She has been a practicing artist since the early 1980s, producing over 50 solo exhibitions and participating in over 150 exhibitions, both nationally and abroad. She has received more than 30 research and achievement awards for her art. She has traveled extensively and has had highly productive artist residencies at the BAMP Center for the Arts in Canada and the Musée du Pont Aven in Brittany, France. She holds the Mary W. Claremont or Mary W. Johnson Professorship at Scribbs College in Claremont, California where she specializes in studio art, media studies, and gender and women's studies. Her work is included in the collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, UCLA Hammer Museum, the Rhode Island School of Design Museum, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Portland Art Museum, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, and the New York Public Library. Upcoming exhibitions of the Fragile Bee are scheduled at the Hardin Center for Cultural Arts in Alabama, the Buffalo Museum of Science in New York, the Alden B. Dow Museum of Science and Art in Michigan, and the Stanford Museum and Nature Center in Connecticut. Thank you so much, Nancy, for joining us this evening. We are really looking forward to hearing more and learning more about your work. 
Thank you, Janie. That was lovely. And I am so pleased to be a part of this. And hello to everyone who I can't see. Thank you for joining us. I especially want to thank Lindsay Marino and Janie Krinas and Chad Cheney for the amazing professional um, efforts in hanging my work and installing it and inviting people, creating all the social media. It's such a thrill, you know, to have the work on the East Coast um get, where it's showing in lancaster pennsylvania and the first time it showed was in lancaster california <laughs> so that's kind of a nice uh coincidence as well but thank you so much you know for inviting me so i think i will share screen and begin the presentation. I decided to put this presentation together chronologically because the work in the Fragile Bee exhibition organized by Catherine T. Carter and Associates um, starts out with this piece, The Honeycomb Wall, which is something that I made in the early 90s. <clears throat> and at that time, I was interested in the bees because of a phrase that I heard in a lecture by Sabina Teubel, be priestesses. And I thought, I love the way that brings nature and spirituality together. And it might give me a way to talk about my feminist interests and my spiritual interests. I imagined the hive to be a utopia where the queen was the mother to all the bees, the worker bees are her daughters, the drones assist in um, getting the queen impregnated so that she can uh, lay all the eggs and the worker bees take care of her during all that time. And it just seemed to me to be um, very romantic in a way, um, you know, a, a sacred space for women, if you will. And many of the pieces in this installation um, give you more of an impression of that. I have excerpts from that installation presented here in a suite of prints that I had made in 1999. These are my first digital prints, but it gives you a chance to see some of the panels in the um, honeycomb wall a little closer. And it was really important to me to include phrases in this work so that people could learn about the bees at the same time that they would be uh, looking at these images. So for instance, this image is actually a chemical three-dimensional model of glucose. Honey is made up of fructose and glucose. And I realize it's quite abstracted, but it interested me. Also the idea that pussy willows were an early source of pollen. Certainly we had pussy willows growing a lot on the, on the East Coast. And here I start to kind of play with the idea of priestesses and priestesses of the goddess are Melissa. The woman's name Melissa means bee in Greek. So Melissa would be the plural of that. Did you know that worker bees were female? That was a surprise. That's always a surprise to people. Um, they don't reproduce, but they have the capacity to do that if, if necessary. The image behind the panels here is from 3500 BC, Central India. It's two figures, one here, and the other one's kind of hard to see back there, smoking bees out of a, a hut that they found. <clears throat> so it's a quite old petroglyph, which I really thought was beautiful because of the time of it and the linear quality of it. Most of us think of a honeycomb this way, I think. Little hexagons put together in a tiled pattern. But in fact, if you look at a honeycomb, you will see <clears throat> the walls that attach the cells create the hexagonal six-sided pattern. <clears throat> but the cell itself is actually round. This is where the queen would lay the eggs. This is where the bees will store honey. They'll store other food, you know, for the winter um, 
they're always preparing in that way. But once I realized this very simple fact that the cell was a circle and not a hexagon, <clears throat> it allowed me to think of different ways to represent the hive. This is a suite of prints called the first 10 prime numbers. And each integer is represented by one of these little circles, which is actually deriving from a page reinforcer. Those little round white things we used to stick on our loose leaf pages when our notebook um, would, when our page would tear in our notebook. And I like the way these begin small and they begin to um, cluster a little bit more. And then as they get bigger, the 10th one is 29. Now they're dispersing. So we don't know if the hive is growing or if it's going to move and create other clusters. I made this suite, which I'm very so grateful to have in the collection at the Met, um, with a master printer named Mark Mahaffey, who had a beautiful print studio in Portland, Oregon. And here he is pulling one of my prints. This is a plate lithograph. There was an exhibition at the Portland Art Museum called 15, 14 Years, 14 Artists, Mahaffey Fine Art, <clears throat> in which my suite was uh, exhibited here. And it ended with another print we did together in the Garden of the Bee Priestess Cornucopia. So the honeycomb wall was made in the early 90s. Those other digital prints were 1999. This is now 2006 that we're working together and developing this work. This is a two plate print, an aqua tint and something else called Spitbite. And the images were created by rubber stamping onto an etching plate and then having that processed. And the pieces of the plate that are revealed take the ink and here you can see the gold plate. This form that I have in here, I think of it as the bee priestess. And you can also see a lot more little rings, um, again, referring to a cell in the honeycomb. We made a, another group of prints called In the Garden of the Bee Priestess Sacred Grove. Again, using the same system of printing on an etching plate with rubber stamps and then etching the um, exposed areas so that they would hold ink. And this is one of the sacred groves. This is a stamp of a Minoan snake goddess. I have a big collection of bee priestesses and bees and roses and flowers and trowels and garden tools um, to create these sort of rituals. This is sacred grove two. These are great fun to make. Um, you can't really take away something you've stamped. So it's uh, kind of a one time only, although you can add. And then we decided to layer the plates. So we put a background of this beautiful cobalt blue down first and then printed a gold plate and a silver plate for in the garden of the bee priestess suite two. I had traveled to France right before I made these and I had the privilege of going to Versailles and the textiles there were in incredible extraordinary and I feel I have never used this color before or after and the Mahaffey said you know what's inspiring this blue and I said I really think it's the Versailles tapestries and the Versailles textiles because it's it's just so rich. So we did three of these. And now I want to talk about the, pho the photographic work. When my wife and I moved into our current home, we inherited a rose garden. I was always taking pictures of the roses in their life cycle from bud to bloom to seed and capturing the bees enjoying their pollen. At that time, I was in the garden a lot with my mom who was aging and suffering from memory loss. So it was a quiet respite for both of us. Not surprisingly, after she died, I seemed to be very drawn to the abject moments the plants produced and found great interest in capturing rotting seeds, moldy fruit, and desiccated plant material. I was fascinated with the moment when something went from full bloom to shriveled petals, 
aging in all its glory. The work you're looking at right now is the first of what I hope will be numerous suites called botanical portraits. We had begun to grow vegetables and I became obsessed with photographing the plants at all stages of their fruiting. I was only interested in shooting with a macro lens. It was key for me to share what I could see at close range and in a large scale format. So the image you're looking at here is 40 by 40 inches, roughly. In order to get really close to everything, I w used the camera handheld. So I had to be really very still and hold my breath a lot, no tripod. Eventually, the vegetable garden gave rise to growing native bee attracting plants. And I purchased nine species from what was then called the Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden. It's now been renamed California Botanic Garden here in Claremont. And I documented these plants for a year. They became botanical portraits, SoCal 2014. The first one that you saw was uh, Farewell Tonight, Clarkia ammonia. This is buckwheat. <clears throat> My idea is to have a detail of the cycle of the plant in inset into the hexagons that you see here. And in some cases, the background image is a full image of the plant. Um, you'll see further on, um, it's a detail of the plant and instead one of the hexagons shows you the full plant so that you get some idea of its actual size and scale. This is desert marigold. This one's called gum plant and it really is gooey. So I had these in our backyard for a year and I'd go out and watch them all the time and um, catch them at their different parts of the cycle of um, bud to bloom to seed. So the lighting is different in many of the insets because it was at different times of the year. This is yarrow. And I love this milkweed. It, it's kind of desiccated right now because as you can see in some of the insets, the monarch caterpillars found it and basically ate every possible leaf on it. And I have a really great video of one just chomping um, but for the sake of time, I didn't add it to the presentation. And then I also like to include images of the bees themselves on the plants so that you can, it sort of verifies that yes, um, the bees do thrive on a plant like this. And this is summer lupin, which I know also grows um, at higher altitudes. So I wasn't making work specifically about the bees for quite a while and reading a lot about colony collapse disorder, understanding that pesticides and the varro mite and um, other things that crops were being sprayed with were causing the bees to lose their memory and not find their way home, causing disease to get into the hives that were killing off the hives and beekeepers were losing hives by the thousands. You've probably read about this. It's not in the news as much these days, but maybe five or seven years ago, it was pretty rampant. So it seemed to me the bees were calling for more support and more knowledge to be shared. And so I decided to make another multi-paneled hexagonal installation work. <clears throat> and this is called Honey Teachings in the Mother Tongue of the Bees. I was more, thinking more about indigenous plants as well as the trees that make the panels. And so I worked with a carpenter who helped me identify kumala, bird's eye maple, yellow heart, and wenge as woods that were somewhat endangered that I might be able to use to have him make the panels for me. The first piece from the 90s was mostly all plywood and um, I wasn't really thinking a lot about the craftsmanship of the panels as much as the imagery that was being placed upon them. This is an installation of <clears throat> one of the exhibitions Catherine Carter put together at the Museum of the Southwest in Midland, Texas. This is the first installation 
and it's at the Lancaster Museum of Art and History. And you can see the mural on the right here, which I'll show you another picture of in a minute. <clears throat> this space was so generous, the ceilings are so high, the mural is actually 12 by 36 feet wide. It's a little difficult to travel something that large and not a lot of venues can install it anyway. So now it's in a smaller version of itself, <clears throat> six by 18 feet. And this is it at um, Texas A&M University. And on this slide, you can also see a legend I created identifying the plants that were inside each of the hexagons. This uh, photography took place in the wildlife, uh, or, or excuse me, um, the wildflower uh, setting that they had at the Botanic Garden in Claremont. And I went there and talked to the horticulturists to get the names of the plants so that I could display this information. So it can be really helpful for botany students and um, people that need to know, you know, the actual species. These are excerpts of some of the sections in the honey teachings. Again, I'm using phrases. This time they're a little bit more dire. This um, installation is really speaking to the plight of the bees and trying to get people to understand um, what's really going on. In certain sections, I'm recreating hive-like um, images using the rings again. This is actually a wax mold that somebody gave to me from France. Um, this slide <clears throat> talks a lot about uh, some of the deficiencies that the bees are going through, stress accelerated decline, and bee deficiency. Sorry, I can't read that one. And some of these images are also drawing from my printmaking. So here again, you can see um, some stamping happening. These were reproduced as uh, color digital output images and affixed to the panels. This <clears throat> image in particular, I grabbed from the New York Times. Scramble to save millions of bees as truck tips over near Seattle, April 17th, 2015. In this installation, I included phrases over a 10 year period of headlines about the bees. In 2006, NPR News said, <clears throat> declining bee population threatens major growers. In, 20, in 2007, CBS News said, the case of the vanishing bees. CNN said, millions pledged to stop general bee decline in 2009, and so on. US sets up honeybee loss task force, <clears throat> excuse me, 2014. In this particular group of images, <clears throat> this bee was down inside a squash blossom. For the longest time, I thought she was dead. It gave me a chance to take a lot of pictures because she wasn't moving. She was just writhing around down there, having a great time. And finally, she crawled out and over the edge of the blossom, loaded with pollen and could barely move. I think she was drunk but it was such a treat to be able to get the lens down inside the squash blossom and view her. Here she is hanging on, you know, with a lot of pollen attached to her back legs, which is how the bees will transport the pollen. Here's a even better view of that. Oppressed, undervalued, malnourished, overworked, abused. And yet, bees are the most ancient source of our connection to food. If bees were to disappear, we think, <clears throat> we would only have a few years to live. I had the idea to photograph the bees <clears throat> and native bee attracting plants in different climates and regions of the US and Europe. I created botanical portraits mile high, which you see here, from a shoot at the Denver Botanical Garden in 2018. I've also shot at the Brooklyn Botanical Garden, the New York Botanical Garden, 
the planting fields in Oyster Bay, Long Island. And when I was traveling in Europe, in Stockholm, Amsterdam, and Berlin. This is an ongoing project, and I hope I can return to it once again, because I'd love to visit Kew Gardens in London. <clears throat> so these species are very different than the plants in Southern California. And again, I'm showing you the plant with the bud. Here it's flowering. This one's really attracted many, many bees. And here is the seed that it will eventually, you know, drop off and replenish itself. And here's the plant in situ so you can get a sense of the scale, the size, and sort of how they grow. Sorry, my, I'm not advancing here. <clears throat> Not quite sure what's happening. Okay, I need to stop for a second. I'm gonna um, stop my video for a second. I have to fix this. <clears throat> okay, sorry about that. I, I think this will work. Um, this is another same species, but different colors, quite wonderful, called Desert Candle. Hmm. Okay, I'm not really sure why this isn't letting me advance. Let me try this. Okay. Sorry, this is working better. Um, and a third sample of the desert candle. Great golden knapweed. Quite large, huge, voluminous balls that explode into these wonderful yellow puffs. Blanket flower, which <clears throat> produces numerous blooms with all of different colors on them. And this particular bee carries the pollen on the back of it. So this is um, the, uh, this is, sorry, the underside of the bee. So it's a different species than some of the others that we've seen. This is very popular in Colorado, the Rocky Mountain beard tongue, and it gets quite tall. And this is pink bergamot, which uh, creates these tough little blossoms, almost cabbage-like. And then each one of these fistules develops into its own um, stamen, which the bee will then pollinate one to the other. This is how it starts, closed up, beginning to bloom here, a different critter enjoying it here. And you can sort of see the whole passage of how this becomes the bloom. and another knapweed. Believe it or not, this group was all shot on the same day, and yet all the color in the background is being produced by the other plants that were around it. The exhibition at uh, Franklin and Marshall also includes two videos that I did, and um, Janie's going to take us through the gallery in a like a live 360 on her laptop. So I'm going to end here and I'm just going to let you know again that there is a catalog that accompanies this exhibition, which is available at blurb.com. The contributors include Kathleen Stewart Howe, who is um, the Rempel Director Emerita at Pomona College Museum of Art. Carol Ann Clonarides, an independent curator of contemporary art and media, and Steve Nolan, maker curator and founding director of Art Center College Design's Williamson Gallery, where he initiates projects at the intersection of art and science. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Nancy. That was a great presentation. Definitely gave us a lot more insight into your work and how you have developed that over the last 30 years. So thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the glitch. <laughs> no problem at all. We're used to that at this point. There's always something. <laughs> So we're going to open it up to questions. So please feel free to post any questions that you have in the Q&A box. Um, and we will get to those and present those to Nancy. Um, Lindsay and Chad will be presenting your questions. And as we kind of start taking those questions in, I'm just going to be walking through the gallery um, to give you an idea of how it is laid out and installed in our space. Um, and you can see the work that Nancy chose to include in this specific exhibition. And one of the things that we have as well are two video um, installations that I think we could probably talk a little bit about um, as we dive here a little bit deeper. So we're just here in the foyer um, outside our Nisley Gallery for those of you who are aware and have been in our museum space. Um, and we have our introduction with one of the videos. And then as you enter into the Dana Gallery, we have the 10 prime numbers and some of the botanical prints. As you're walking through, we, we do have a question that has come through, Janie. And um, Nancy, you may have said it. Um, I don't remember if you had said this or not, but do you personally keep bees? This is from Deidre. Um, and if so, are you in the city or the country? So no, I don't keep bees because I just don't think I can take on that responsibility. Mm -hmm. I'm not in the country. I wish I was in the country. So where I live in Claremont, the city ordinance won't allow me to have bees if I wanted them because I'm too close to other people's yards. I would need to be living on a third of an acre and then oh. I could have bees. <clears throat> so people do have them. Okay. And chickens too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have another question here. Um, how has your work or approach to documenting bee attracting flora changed over the past 30 years? Have environmental changes affected your ability to access the plants that you think are or that are central to pollinators? Well, I didn't start documenting them that long ago. Mm -hmm. um, I started, you know, learning about the bees and studying and researching and thinking of it more in terms of a utopia, um, a matriarchal society, I was really interested in ancient goddess cultures. So my awareness of the, the plants the bees were attracted to didn't come until, you know, maybe like the mid 2000s, maybe around 2010 or 11. And it, it actually came through spending so much time in my garden. Um, I was there a lot with my mom and we had flowers, we inherited a rose garden. And then we started changing the landscape of the garden and planting vegetables and just seeing how the bees visited plants in different ways. And, you know, some attracted them more than others. And then realizing that the botanical garden in Claremont could provide plants for me that would be bee attracting, you know, they would advertise that and say, you know, this is what you can do to help the life of the bees, you know, and support them, you know, just one small piece. And I thought, well, this is a great message to get out. If I can just share with people wherever you live, if you have bee attracting plants in your yard, you'll at least be contributing to the culture of the bees and the, the health of the bees uh -huh. you know, in, in a really positive way. Yeah. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how, I mean, in California, um, climate has changed drastically in the last 15 years. When I look at pictures of our garden from when we first moved into this house and now, I'm, you know, everything we have is drought tolerant. We don't have the greenery. We don't have the moisture. We don't, we, we never have humidity. And so it's changed what's possible. When we grow tomato plants in the summer, I have to put umbrellas over them. Oh, wow. So that they don't, you know, roast to death in the sunshine. Uh -huh. you know, so now we have one of those shade cloths, but it's, it's really changed a lot. And obviously, you know, it's due to worldwide climate change. And so I would imagine that's the case in most regions that 
um, we have to make a special, a conscious effort to have be attracting plants for the health of the bees. Mm. That was a great question. So thanks, whoever asked that. All right. Uh, do you want to take the next one? Yeah, I do. So, um, so Nancy, we have another question here. It's, uh, have you had any particularly memorable encounters with bees while you've been engaged in this work, um, whether it's been favorable or not so favorable? <laughs> so my only bee sting was when I was a little kid in my grandmother's backyard, <clears throat> and she grew these plants that she called them spider flowers, and they don't grow on the West Coast. So I actually have a few pictures of them in the honeycomb wall as an homage to her and that particular plant. Um, and when I read about that plant um, in, in a book with like old bee lore, it said it would produce, you know, like um, huge amounts of nectar that the bees would drink and fall off the plant drunk. So that's probably the bee I stepped on in her garden. But um, they, the, I'm, I'm pretty calm around bees. I'm, you know, I, I'm okay with that. I don't think I'm allergic. And I'm often visited by a bee. I'll be someplace. I'll have a bee will land on my windshield. It'll be on my side, the door to my car. They just appear. You know, if I see one struggling, I pick it up and put it somewhere safe. Um, when they're flying around in the yard, they don't bother me. But, I, you know, we put a little bowl out with rocks in it and filled it up with water so that they'd have moisture you know, when it gets really hot and then you, you constantly have to replenish that. Um, no, I, I like them and um, I feel pretty safe around them. We have a friend who recently, because she lives on third of an acre, got bees and invited Jan and I over to help her install them. Oh. And so we had to suit up and we had to dump them out of this can <laughs> into the hives that she had. And, you know, there were like, 10,000 of them, you know, three <laughs> pounds of bees. Very you know, nerve wracking. <laughs> it was crazy, you know, and, and we watched a video of how to do it and then did it. And then Jan videoed us doing that. It was really pretty hilarious. You can YouTube anything, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. How to do that. So that's my closest encounter to thousands of bees at once. <laughs> um, we have a question from Gretchel, and she said that there's been some research that bees have some understanding of math, and then some of the research has been questioned. What do you think? I don't know that. I, I don't see why they wouldn't. I mean, you know where it, I think it comes in with um, how they find a source mm -hmm. and go back to the hive and dance the direction of it. Right. So there's a thing called the waggle dance that's supposed to look like a figure eight, but the bees will dance in other ways, depending on the kind of bee it is, and communicate to the other bees that can forage where she found this source. And they use the sun as part of the directionality of that. Uh -huh. And then they know which direction to go out and find it. And it could be a few miles away, but that's what, I mean, when a bee is born, she's only, the worker bees only live 30 days. The queen bees can live up to five years and her entire life is laying eggs. So it's not, you know, it's quite a, quite a responsibility. Yeah, it's incredible. The, the worker bee, the first thing she does coming out of her little cell backwards is clean it, right? I'm like, oh, just like all women, clean. <laughs> and then she, she's so young, you know, she's a week, but her first week she's a nurse bee. So she goes around and she helps other bees in the hive do things. It's only the second week that she can leave the hive and forage uh -huh. and bring pollen back. And then, you know, for the last two weeks, and then they, they're constantly being repopulated um, in the hive. It's, it's a pretty extraordinary, they're a super organism. They're not individual. They are one organism with many, many parts that all communicate with each other. So um, maybe there's some math buried in that way of communicating as well, Gretchel, I don't know, but it's, it's a great question. Thank you. I have a, I have a question from Terry. Uh, uh, such beautiful pictures. Uh, during your work, I can only imagine you must have experienced what each type of plant or flower smelled like. Uh, any comments on how the scents of these flowers played or did not play a role in your work or in the way that the bees behaved? 
Wow, what a thoughtful question. You know, actually, they didn't really have a significant scent. You know, currently, we have a big um, area in our garden that's all lavender. Mm. That I can smell. And especially if you're cleaning, you know, weeding and stuff and you brush against the leaves, mm. it really gives off quite a, quite a fusion of smell. But none of these that I can think of, and I'm looking at my slides right now, no, I wish I could say that that would be even more intriguing, you know, um, in terms, you know, sunflowers don't really have a smell. Perhaps, you know, it's the color really is attracting to the bees as well, you know. That's for sure. They do. Their eyes are like a mosaic, mm -hmm. it, almost like a honeycomb of its own. And they see colors differently, which which is true, I think, of most many other like cats and dogs as well but they have a way of reading based on color and I think temperature. Wonderful. So we have um, qu uh, two questions from, from Rick. Um, so it's a two part question. He said, it's, this is a fascinating presentation. And he said, could you please say something more about the print of the Rocky Mount beard tongue? The background seems almost like the plant was photographed in a studio but the others you showed feature a blurred background of other plants. He said he's just curious about that. No, that's a great question. And in fact, um, let's see. I'm looking at the slides of them. That Is that the one you're on, Janie? Is Janie on the? No, but it's easy to find because it's got a black background. Rick, I think you are correct. The one next to it, the um, the milkweed one, there was so much distracting imagery behind it because it was growing in the ground in front of the barbecue that we did bring a black cloth out and oh. held it behind it to make it look like it was photo studio. Oh. And I think we probably did the same thing for the, um, the one you're talking about. That's the purple. Yeah, the summer. Oh, the Rocky Mountain. Well, wait a minute. No, let me get up to it. Um, and he was also asking, have you ever thought about incorporating the sound of bees in this exhibition, almost as a kind of musical score on an intermittent tape loop? I love that idea. When I first displayed the honeycomb wall, around the same time, I um, attended a performance by a jazz tap dancer. And her work was so unique, you know, it wasn't like Yankee Doodle Dandy tap dancing, right? It wasn't what you might think of. It was so much more contemporary. And she performed with jazz musicians on stage. And someone I knew knew her. And I said to her, would you let me record you tapping just a cappella with no music? And so I went to her studio and I got some special recording equipment and she improvised all over because the tap dancing reminds me um, of the bees and the waggle dance. Right. And the Lore of the Bee Priestess video has a section of flamenco dancing and a little inset of tap dancing in the corner of it. Mm -hmm. And so I had that on a tape loop during the first exhibition, which was called Dance of the Melissa. Um, at the Brand Library and Art Museum in Glendale, California. So I have incorporated sound. Um, there is the sound of bees humming in the Bee Stories video and also in the Lore of the Bee Priestesses. So I have used it as sound, but not, not necessarily in the installation. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm looking at Rocky Mountain Beard Tongue and I know I shot this on location at the Denver Botan Botanical Garden. So it, I think I probably just cleaned the background up. So it was an even darkness because I wasn't able to uproot it. Maybe it was getting close to the end of the day or um, I was in a shaded area when I shot, but that's really observant, Rick. So thank you. Rick is one of our photography faculty here on campus. David Rothenberg makes music with bees. Mike in the hive and him on the clarinet. I love that. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, uh, Nancy, I have another question. Um, how do you choose the materials you use to create the, uh, the hexagon sculptures, um, particularly within honeycomb wall or uh, honey teachings? Um, are, you know, particularly you use different materials, whether they're sculptural or, um, or the prints or, or just blank panels. Um, how do they relate to each other or are they just aspects of design? Well, the blank ones are there to give your eye a rest. And um, I like to activate the negative space of the wall, which is what the clusters allow us to do and suggest a, a panel where there is not one. So that's why when I made Honey Teachings, the quality of the panels was more important to me because I, I felt like the richness of the wood would make a big difference. So you can see where Janie is right now. Um, there's some blank ones that are, um, bird's eye maple, and then the dark one it, next to it is Wenge, which is this beautiful African wood. In terms of the images, some are straight photography. We had bees in, a, in our garage roof, and when they smoked them out and took the hive out, <coughs> excuse me, I was able to photograph some of the honeycomb and use that. I work extensively in Photoshop. Um, manipulate the images a little bit with blend modes. I often layer them, um, especially if it's a kind of a print sort of image. The ones that Janie's on right now are all petals from our roses that were finishing. And we had them in a big bin. And I just took a lot of pictures of it because I thought they were so beautiful. And the edges were so frilly and um, it was so, you know, evocative. The cult, the light was gorgeous. And looking at them close up, they're very rich. So, you know, they look like textiles or, or um, skirts. Now that one, um, somebody gave me a 33 RPM uh, record cover that had stories about the bees in it. I don't think I have the record, but she gave me the cover which had some pages. So I scanned it and I used it as the background of that. And the honeycomb that's in that on the bottom was the honeycomb that came from the bees that were in our garage, in our roof. So I saved it and then, and it's not easy to glue honeycomb, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> natural organic things like honeycomb don't really like uh, man, person made glue. So, so far so good. <laughs> So I actually have a question um, that's my, a question I had for myself. Um, I was really intrigued by all the ties to um, feminism and uh, Greek and Roman mythology. And uh, it's something that I'd love to hear some more about. I, I can see that there's a lot of Greek and Roman mythology and its ties to be folklore. Um, are there any parts of your work that pull from other ancient civilizations or, um, I just was really curious about hearing you expand a little bit on on that side of it because I never really thought about bees being part of ancient civilizations folklore. Oh yeah, and in Egypt especially, there are some steles with pictures of bees. Um, bees have been around for fifty five million years, so they are the perfect cyborg. There's not a part of a bee that's a waste. Everything has a function. It's it's kind of astonishing. Um, I learned about a culture in Romania or in the whole Eastern European area, like Romania, Moldavia kind of area called Cucateni. And they are 5,000 to 3,500 BC. And they um, functioned in three sections. And there's a lot of research about the culture related to pottery, because it turns out that they were using a wheel of some kind to build their large pots because somebody did a, analysis of the um, distribution of the elements in the clay body mm. and they tell that the way it was dispersed it had to have been spinning so um, they didn't really have a lot to do with bees but it was another really interesting ancient culture for me to learn about which they think was matriarchal and um, I think you know the one we know the most about were the Minoans right um, and that's the beginning of written history we don't know a lot before that because 
things were not recorded. Mm -hmm. Sure, those, you know, stories were told probably orally. So the shape that you had mentioned was the bee priestess, the almost plum bob shape that actually what Janie's got on the screen right now. Tell us if you could expand on how, how that you envision that being the bee priestess. Well, to me, it looks like an ancient, not that one, but the, the one that looks a little bit more like the arrowhead. Mm -hmm. And I had it in a slide and I think a few slides didn't get shown. <laughs> somehow things skipped. But um, before I moved to Southern California, I was finishing uh, graduate school and I had this great studio in Emeryville near Berkeley. And I was going into the building one day and I found this little metal thing in the gutter with strings coming off it. Mm -hmm. So it had broken off of something, but it wasn't a three-dimensional tripod. It was a flat I mean, plum bob. It was a flat plum bob, which I didn't find out for years later that it was actually to plumb wallpaper, mm. which meant a lot to me as well because I had used wallpaper great a great deal in my early works on paper, you know, in graduate school and after that. And I hung this thing by the phone because you know in those days you were tethered to the phone. You didn't go. The phone didn't go with you, and I'd stare at it all the time. And I painted glitter on it, you know, and I just played with it a little bit, but it kept looking like this ancient goddess symbol. And I had a residency at the um, Virginia Center for Creative Art in um, south of Washington, DC. And I brought things with me that I didn't know what to do with, thinking, well, this is gonna be like a sabbatical, a little respite. I'll just bring things to kind of learn, figure. And I used that for the first time in a, kind of installation piece that I made. And then it began to have more and more value. Um, what you're seeing right now in the video, um, I got a tattoo of that plum bob with bees coming off of it at a certain point, you know, um, to kind of wear the bee priestess. But for me, it was, I just kind of pushed those two things together and decided this is the symbol in my work for my idea of the bee priestess, which started, you know, so many years ago, looking for a path or a way to explore and express my ideas about feminism and my my spiritual ideas. Thank you. Chad, do you see Deidre's question? Yes, yes, I think, I think we have time for just her last question here. Um, Deirdre asked, uh, are you mainly focused on honeybees in particular, or I, I, I suppose all, or all pollinator bees? Because of where I'm living, it's mostly honeybees. Mm -hmm. I know that there are blue bees and green bees, and they have quite an assortment of bees in Oregon, um, but I haven't really had time to go on a, like a bee exploration, which I would love to do. Oh, there's the plum bob right behind Janie. That's it spinning. Thank you, Janie. Perfect timing. <laughs> so now you can all see what it looks like because I did. Ha I wish I the slide had shown, but it didn't. But um, yeah, but mostly Apis mellifera, the the general honeybee. Thank you so much, Nancy. My pleasure. This was so much fun for me. I haven't done anything live like this in, in quite a while. <laughs> Really nice question. So thoughtful. I really appreciate it. Well, that was great. Well, thank you, Nancy, for joining us this evening and sharing your passion with all of us. And for all of the attendees, thank you for choosing to spend your time with the Phillips Museum of Art. We hope you'll be able to come and join us as we open our doors on Tuesday, February 1st. And please check our website and social media um, for upcoming events. Um, so we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you, everyone. Libby, Chad, Janie, and Lindsay, I really enjoyed my time with you. And everyone I can't see, but thank you for your questions. Maybe I'll be out before the show comes down. <laughs> that would be wonderful. You'll yeah. see that we're right in the center of campus. It's like its own hive. <laughs> I love it. Great. Thank you, Nancy. You're welcome. Thank you so much.